So chapter 23, in this chapter, we're going to talk about covalent bonding and the forces in between molecules and also their bulk physical properties. So um, to start out with, let's talk about polar versus nonpolar mo molecules. These are the two big categories of any molecule. Just pro tip, okay, for the test and for your life in general, I guess. Whenever I say the word molecule, I automatically mean covalent bonding. I will never talk about a molecule of salt, okay? That's wrong. So whenever you see the word molecule or hear the word molecule, you automatically know it's covalent bonding, okay? So that's kind of a shortcut. With covalent bonding, two types, polar and nonpolar. Now, polar molecules are molecules in which there is a dipole. A dipole means I have one end of my molecule is minus or negatively charged, and one end of my molecule is positively charged. Polar molecules happen because there is an unequal distribution of electrons in the molecule. So this happens because I have some atoms in my molecule that are more electronegative than others. If you remember from previous chapters, electronegativity, some atoms are more greedy for electrons than other atoms. So we look at water. Water is our poster child for a lot of things. But in this case, it is poster child for polar molecule. So oxygen is much more electronegative than hydrogen. So it's going to suck the electrons towards itself. And so if you look kind of like at an orbital, you see the electrons would spend more time up around the oxygen than the hydrogens. Because electrons are negative, this makes the oxygen negatively charged or more negatively charged and the hydrogen more positively charged. It's important to note that for this class, molecules are always net neutral. So I'm not talking about a full blown, full, blah, blah, okay. I'm not talking about a full blown extra negative charge here. All I'm talking about is a, this side of the molecule is more negative and this side is more positive, but the whole molecule is net neutral. There's also another class. We have nonpolar molecules. Our nonpolar molecules are molecules in which there's an equal distribution of electrons. There are two things you need to look for when you're deciding whether a molecule is polar or nonpolar. One thing is, do I have really electronegative atoms? Okay, these are atoms next to fluorine that are just really greedy. Okay, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, or sulfur tend to be very electronegative. Um, if you have those in your molecule, there's a good chance that it's polar. Okay, the other test you need to do is for symmetry. Okay, you notice on this side I have some nonpolar molecules I've written. This is methane, CH4, carbon dioxide, and oxygen gas. Now you notice carbon dioxide and oxygen and gas have oxygen. And oxygen is very electronegative. So some people might be like, oh, well, then it's polar. But you have to look at this. You kind of have to think about the atoms having tug of war over the electrons. So with oxygen gas, I have two oxygens bound to each other. If you were going to have a tug of war with a clone of yourself, who would win? Answer, no one would win like the electrons in this bond. So oxygen gas is nonpolar. Same kind of idea with carbon dioxide. I, because carbon dioxide is straight, it's a linear molecule, my two oxygens are going to be fighting over the electrons in the middle. In your textbook, you can see a nice color picture of this. But you do get negative charges, kind of the electrons get pulled out, and you get negative charges on both ends and positive in the middle. But it is symmetric. I can't draw a line roughly halfway through this molecule, such that one side is minus and one side is plus. Okay, like, I mean, oh, still two minus on both sides. So this isn't going to be a polar molecule because I don't have all my minus on one side, all my plus on the other side. Okay? Now, methane is also nonpolar. One, because it's symmetric. Now, carbon is a bit more electronegative than hydrogen, but not by much. And also, um, even if my minus was in the middle, like, I still, I can't draw a line roughly halfway through this molecule because it one end is plus, one end is minus. So it's also not going to be polar. Okay? So within my category of polar and nonpolar, different forces apply. So with my nonpolar molecules, they exert dispersion forces on each other. Okay? That's the intermolecular force that holds them together to form solids and liquids. Okay, this force is pretty weak. Dispersion force is formed from spontaneous 
um, temporary dipoles that form. And these dipoles form because of the kind of random nature of electrons. So for an instant, a nonpolar molecule can have one more, more electrons on one side than the other. And this forms a weak temporary dipole. And that can attract the other nonpolar molecules. Now, it's not as important to know how dispersion forces work, but um, that they're very weak. They're the weakest intermolecular force that we have. So now we're going to look at our polar molecules. Okay, polar molecules have stronger intermolecular forces. Okay, the big category I have is dipole-dipole. The dipole of one molecule attracts to the dipole of another molecule. So in this case, in the case of water, I would have another water molecule, and the negative end of this water molecule would attract to the positive end of another water molecule. So that is what dipole-dipole forces are. Now, there is a subset of dipole-dipole forces okay, called hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is just a super strong form of dipole-dipole. So hydrogen bonding happens whenever I have hydrogen bound to F, O, or N. Okay? I will have hydrogen bonding. Now in this case, water will do hydrogen bonding. And the reason we care about the difference between dipole-dipole and hydrogen bonding is because the force in between the molecules correlates to the melting and bonding point. So the stronger the force, the harder it is to break apart the molecules, and thus the higher temperature you need to melt or boil your molecules. So in this case, water will do hydrogen bonding. An example of a polar molecule that won't do hydrogen bonding would be formaldehyde. Okay? So this molecule is polar. Okay, my oxygen up top is kind of sucking up my electrons from the bottom. Okay, so this end is going to be minus, this end is going to be plus. But it is, my hydrogen is bound to carbon. It's not bound to um, oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen. So in this case, let's kind of do a little exercise and see um, kind of the order of melting points, okay, for these molecules. So water is going to have the highest melting point, okay, because it is doing hydrogen bonding, and that is the strongest force. Formaldehyde over here is going to have the second highest melting and boiling point because it is polar. It's doing dipole-dipole, but dipole-dipole force is not as strong as hydrogen bonding, and so it will melt or boil at a slightly lower temperature. The third highest melting and boiling point would be all our nonpolar molecules. Okay, they would be number three because they're um, interacting with dispersion forces, which is the weakest. Okay, so in order of strength, we have hydrogen bonding is the strongest, dipole-dipole is the second strongest, and dispersion force is the weakest. Now let's talk about the physical properties of covalent materials. Covalent materials are always non-conductive, transparent, and they have low melting and boiling points relative to ionic and metallic bonded materials. So they're non-conductive because we have no moving charges. All covalent molecules are neutral, okay? The electrons in covalent molecules cannot jump between molecules. So my, I don't have any electrons that can move, and I don't have any ions that can move. So no conduction of electricity. Second thing is that covalent materials are transparent. They have widely spaced energy levels. And because they have widely spaced energy levels, the um, visible light does not have enough energy to promote the electron to the next energy level. So because it doesn't have enough energy, the um, electron cannot absorb it and just lets it go straight through. Um, third thing is they have low melting and boiling points. Now the reason for this is because when I melt or boil a covalent substance, I am not breaking the bonds between the atoms. Okay? So many people, so many students have this problem. They think, oh, things with double bonds have higher melting and boiling points because the double bond is stronger. Okay, that is a false notion. Do not think that. Okay? When I melt or boil covalent stuff, I'm breaking the intermolecular forces, not the forces between the atoms. And this is because my intermolecular forces, my dispersion, dipole-dipole, and hydrogen bonding forces are much weaker than the forces in between atoms, so my covalent, ionic, and metallic bonding. Okay? So when I melt or boil an ionic or metallic substance, I'm breaking those interatomic forces. Okay? 
But when I melt or boil a covalent material, I'm not breaking those. I'm breaking my intermolecular forces, which are much weaker. In chapter 23, what we talked about is how to tell if a molecule is polar versus nonpolar and what that can tell you about the melting or boiling point. Okay, and also the physical properties of molecular material. Okay, so they're non-conductive, transparent, and have low melting and boiling points.